Hi everyone, I'm Lynn Trong with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have a couple options. You can either listen through your computer or telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing so, we'll eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you select the telephone option, you should already see a box that displays your telephone number and audio pin. Panelists, we ask that you please mute your audio device while you're not presenting. If you have any technical difficulties with the webinar today, you can contact the GoToWebinar's help desk for assistance. Throughout the webinar, um, you're welcome to ask a question. Please use the questions pane to type in your question. If you are having difficulty viewing the materials, today's web webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available. And now for today's presentation. Our t webinar today is Solar Decathlon, Major Innovations from the High Performance Buildings Industry. Our speakers today are Rachel Romero, Project Leader and Energy Engineer at NREL and Design Challenge Manager. Sam Raskin, DOE Building Technologies Office, Chief Architect and Co-Director of Solar Decathlon and a list of amazing sponsors. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Rachel to start today's presentation. Hi everyone, uh, we're so glad to have you on the webinar today. Uh, we are going to first go over some of the stars of the 2019 Slow Decathlon Design Challenge, and then our Sam Rashkin, uh, the co-director from the U.S. Department of Energy is going to talk to us a little bit today about uh, why this is important. And then our 2019 Solar Decathlon Design Challenge sponsors will tell you about their companies and all the amazing resources they have to offer you. We'll conclude with some competition information and then answer your questions. So with that, let's talk about the stars of the 2019 Solar Decathlon Design Challenge. So this is the location of the 2019 participating collegiate institutions and uh, you all, all the teams come from all over the country. Um, so everyone's looking for their school right now. But not only do we come from all over the US, we come from all over the world. We have a school from almost all the continents and uh, we're so glad that you're here with us this year. We have 80 participating teams from 65 collegiate institutions. 24 of the collegiate institutions are coming to the design challenge for the first time. And of course then 41 are returning to compete again and go for the trophies at the end. We do have 13 teams that are comprised of one or of two or more collegiate institutions. Um, we definitely uh, value the uh, collaboration that comes from that. And several of our teams have competed in many of these challenges to date. So we are from uh, across 12 countries and six continents, and I think this will provide for a really exciting challenge this year. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sam Raskin, the co-director for the Solar Decathlon, to tell us a little bit about why we're here today. Sam? We can't hear you, Sam, if you're talking. Oh, hey, thanks. Hey, thank you, Rachel. And uh, before I begin, this is my first time able to address uh, a participants in the competition since the registration uh, deadline has uh, come and gone. And uh, I want to say that when you do an event, I think the hardest part uh, by far is always getting the right people in the room. And uh, since we were able to kind of go over all the registrant teams and look at who's coming, we have definitely got the right people in the room. This is such a great group of schools from such a diverse set of geographic locations, uh, different countries, uh, different type of universities. This is guaranteed going to be just another incredible competition for us and we just couldn't be happier. And I'm glad you're here at this first webinar since the registration. Uh, and Rachel want me to speak about why it's important. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, to do that, let me give you a, 
some context for the uh, way research works and the way industries work. So here's a typical number of companies in most of corporate America. It's so small on the scale, you can hardly see it. Normally six to a dozen companies will dominate any individual industry. But then if you click it again and move to the housing industry, go ahead and click. Go ahead. Uh, that's, uh, there you'll see the number of home builders exceeds 50,000 home builders. Uh, used to be over 100,000 before the downturn or nearly 100,000 before the downturn. But this is an amazing reality for you to understand about the housing industry. There are tens and tens of thousands of producers. And as such, for no one's fault, they're not equipped to do innovation the way other industries are. They don't have the built-in competency in their companies, and uh, they don't have the built-in resources to do innovation. Uh, even more so, if you look at the structure of how the housing industry works, uh, unlike Europe, about 95% of the home building companies are dominated by investments in land assets and 5% in production assets. Europe is kind of flipped, so it's different, but the US companies most of our assets are in land and not in product development. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see something that's not surprising when you have such a fragmented industry. So if we hit it one more time, Lynn, we can go ahead and hit the slides. On the right, you'll see the US home builders again in terms of percent of revenues invested in R&D is such a small sliver, like less than one tenth of 1% compared to US corporations that are nearly 4%. And the way we get the U.S. home builder investment number, we collect the annual reports from the publicly owned builders, and we look at the ledger sheets and count how much of their assets go into R&D and innovation. That's how we get our number. But you can see that what's not surprising when you have such an incredibly fragmented industry is you do not have the investment in innovation. And uh, corporate America, almost 4% is uh, just a magnitude more investment. Now, when we take the manufacturers and uh, product companies and hit it again, Lynn, we'll see that that gets it to about 1.2%. So thank goodness for the product manufacturers because they are such a important source of innovation for the housing industry. They have the resources and the competencies that are missing from the individual home builders. So if we hit the slide again, Today, we're gonna to learn, learn about innovation, about different companies that are working in the housing industry. And these are really important companies for you to know about because like many other companies, they are the source of innovation in the housing industry. And so today's webinar is really important for you to get really a good sense of where the industry is going, some new opportunities, what technology can do. So I think this is a really great way to kick off our webinar series since the registration has uh, has expired and we move forward into the competition. Thank you so much for coming. and I hope you find these next presentations really helpful. Great, thank you, Sam. So with that, we have several sponsored presentations today and we'll introduce you to them as we go. To kick off, we have Lance McNevin from the Plastic Pipes Institute. Lance is a professional engineer, is the director of engineering for the building and construction division at the Plastics Pipe Institute. He has been in the plastic pipe industry since 1993 and has been involved with hydronic radiant heating and cooling applications, geothermal piping systems, plumbing and fire protection. In 2015, he joined PPI after 15 years as a member. Lance has developed expertise in mechanical codes and piping standards and is a member of ASHRAE, ASME, ASPE, ASTM, AWWA, CSA, IATMO, NEMA, RPA, and UL, serving on technical committees for most of these organizations. Lance? Hi, Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And thanks for allowing me to uh, have the pleasure of going first here today. I know we have a tight schedule, so I will try my best to stick to it. So this quick little presentation is called Achieving Net Zero Energy with Plastic Piping Solutions, something you probably don't think about when you're conceptualizing uh, your building design, but there's actually pipes inside all our buildings. And uh, these piping systems that we'll talk about can actually do good things when it comes to energy 
uh, energy utilization and delivery. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Quick introductions in terms of who we are, like a lot of the sponsors here. We're an organization. We're not a manufacturer. We're not a company that buys and sells something. We're a trade asso association that's been around for uh, many, many decades, started back in 1950. We have five divisions that focus on different types of piping for different types of applications, but the one that's all about piping used inside buildings and on building properties is called the Building and Construction Division, or BCD. Um, and then the types of products that we represent include CPVC, the picture on the left, a rigid plastic, PEX and PERT, which are flexible coil plastics, high density polyethylene, which is widely used for in-ground geothermal systems, and polypropylene pressure pipe. Um, and then all of these materials can be used for all the applications we're gonna talk about next here. Next slide, please. So the first one that we'll talk about is plumbing. And plumbing might be kind of a boring thing and plumbing pipe might seem like a bit of a boring topic. Um, and that's because if the pipe does a good job, it stays behind the wall and doesn't let the water out and you never think about it again. So that's the goal of these piping systems is to not draw attention to themselves. Um, all the different types of pipes that we represent can be used for the hot and cold water plumbing. Uh, these are the pressure piping systems. Uh, but with the reason that we think that you should even uh, mention them in your designs or think about them in your designs is because they're better than the traditional materials such as copper, because they don't corrode, uh, they cost a lot less, they install much faster, um, they will last longer uh, than traditional metal systems. But most importantly, when it comes to the design of your hot water plumbing system, we can actually save water and save energy because with regular plumbing systems, you typically, when you turn on the hot water faucet, you can waste a lot of water and energy waiting for the hot water to get there. Whereas if you have a timed recirculation system with a recirculation loop and a small circulating pump, that keeps the hot water moving throughout the whole building um, until you need it. And PEC systems make that possible. So um, there's different ways of designing your plumbing system. Uh, and all of this is explained in the documents that we'll provide you with. So that's all I want to say on plumbing for now, just the fact that you should consider that as part of your design. Uh, fire protection is something that is not mandatory in a lot of jurisdictions, but uh, if you go uh, you know, around the world, most hotels, most apartment buildings, most commercial buildings will have these overhead sprinkler systems. In a lot of cases, you don't actually see the sprinkler head because they're hidden behind a little white metal cap that's flush in the ceiling. That's called a concealed cap because most people don't actually want to look at a sprinkler head sticking down through their ceiling. But the type of piping systems that we have are designed and approved for these fire sprinkler systems. And we're just suggesting that in a lot of the designs that these teams will do, including a fire protection system is a great option for life safety. Um, in some cases, it's gonna be mandatory for code compliance because it's required by codes. But in other ideas, we just think, or in other applications, we just think it's a good idea uh, to protect the lives of the people living inside your buildings. These systems aren't expensive. And in a lot of cases, you can actually combine the cold water plumbing pipe, which is going through all the, of the uh, bathroom groups of the building, um, use that same pipe to be your sprinkler pipe so that you have a non-stagnant, non-stop uh, piping system. Next slide, please. Uh, ground source geothermal and the energy side of things. Uh, lots of teams are gonna be using mini splits and VRFs and air to air heat pumps and things like that. Uh, we would recommend that you take a look at water to water heat pumps or water to air heat pumps starting in the ground, using your ground as the, the main heat exchanger as a source of your energy in heating mode and is the energy uh, depository in cooling mode. And the ground source geothermal systems, which have been around for 40 years now in North America, these systems are incredibly efficient. They can deliver high coefficient of performance values or COP values, uh, greater than 450% in heating mode and very high C value, uh, EER values, energy uh, efficiency rating values uh, in cooling mode. And uh, of course they're using plastic pipe, which goes in the ground, uses the ground as the heat exchanger, but the units uh, sit quietly in a closet inside the building. There's no outdoor component that anybody sees. There's nothing that anybody hears. And they're much more efficient because yeah, you're just exchanging heat with the earth as opposed to trying to blow, blow hot air into hot air or make hot air out of cold air outside. So they're very efficient systems and we think they will help your energy analysis and your energy performance in your buildings. And uh, next slide, please. And then a good way of distributing that energy is through radiant systems. And this involves piping embedded in floors, walls, or ceilings. On the graphic here, you can see all three being used. In real life, you would never use a floor, wall, and ceiling in the same room. It's just an illustration graphic. Uh, but the idea here is that small diameter plastic pipes get embedded in those surfaces. And for heating the room, 
It's called radiant heating. You just take warm water from a heat source like a water tank or like the geothermal heat pump, circulate that warm water through the pipes embedded in the floor, gently heat the floor, gently heat the wall, and that will meet all the heating loads and these high performance buildings. And then similarly on the cooling, uh, for many of these buildings, depending on your climate, you can actually meet at least 50% of the cooling load by circulating some slightly chilled water through the pipes in the floor, wall, or ceiling. And then that means the, the other part of the cooling load that has to be met on the air side is much less. So smaller ductwork, smaller fans, which use a lot of energy, smaller fans use less energy. Um, so it ends up being a more comfortable and more efficient heating and cooling distribution system. So to my final slide, please, or just one more. This is just kind of a wrap up. Um, we've created a web page on the PPI web page that has a lot of this information in great detail laid out for you. Uh, there's some links here to some other associations you might want to take a look at to get information there. But if you go to our webpage, plasticpipe.org slash building dash construction, then go to the education tab, click on where it says DOE programs, and then open the page for 2019 Solar Decathlon. We have a bunch of documents posted there for you to give you some a lot more, uh, much more detailed information about how to integrate these systems into your designs. So we wish you all good luck. Look forward to meeting everybody at the event next April. And thank you to Enroll for the time today to share this information. Great, thank you Lance for kicking us off. Our next presenter is Kurt Reisenberg from the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. Kurt has been the executive director of SPFA since 2007, which is headquartered in Fairfax, Virginia. SPFA is the national nonprofit trade association leading the full value chain of the SPF insulation and roofing industry, comprised of professional contractors, distributors, manufacturers of materials, and equipment and professional consultants. Kurt provides executive leadership to SPFA's core technical, certification, marketing, advocacy, and event efforts. Kurt? That's great. Thank you so much. And I'll take a half a second to uh, throw a compliment to the piping folks because I just got done remodeling my house to put it on the market. And PEX in 10 minutes makes you feel like you could be a professional plumber. Between the flexibility of the PEX pipes and the shark bite connectors, uh, it, it, you feel like a pro. It's amazing. So thank you uh, to that industry for bringing out that kind of technology. Uh, so I want to say thanks uh, for having us here again and giving us the opportunity to be a sponsor and participant. Very excited about this and the scope of all the stuff that we do from a day-to-day -day basis. It's all kind of, you know, monotonous and boring, a lot of it. These are the exciting things, the fun things that we really like to get involved with. Uh, so um, that's why we're here. I don't have slides today. Uh, I did slides last time and, uh, you know, they had nominal value. Uh, so I'm going to more introduce ourselves today with a few comments from myself and the organization. Uh, and start off with reintroducing us. SPFA is the Spray Foam Industry Association, uh, representing the value chain of the industry. We have experts and building scientists and the membership and on staff. You're going to hear from Rick Duncan in just a little bit later. He's covering a partner presentation of ours uh, with the American Chemistry Council. He's uh, also a PhD, mechanical engineer, former professor at Bucknell, and a building scientist. Uh, we as an organization do typical trade association-y type things like uh, you know, host committees, trade shows, do building codes, but we also have very active research and development effort that produce things like our life cycle assessment. We could just publish our five-year updated LCA report. I'd encourage anyone that's interested in looking at that, that cradle to grave life cycle data on uh, performance and energy uh, and environment to uh, download that, that document off of our website. Uh, it works on fire testing standards, but we also have a certification department that certifies professional spray foam contractors around the country that have met a bit of very vigorous and demanding ISO 17024 Internationally Standardized Testing Program. Uh, I'd like to say that the design challenge and build challenge now st uh, stemming from the combining these great programs into the solar decathlon is a great move because both efforts take a lot of energy and attention and effort and complement each other so well. SBFA had been a sponsoring partner of the solar decathlon back in 2009, 2011 when I came on board. I went was held back on the mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, I still wear my volunteer shirts when I'm doing yard work or remodeling. We believed in that program then, and we believe in the new iteration that it, it is to become. SBFA has been a sponsor and judge for years with the student design competition because that's also a great program. It forces students to think broadly, creatively, competitively, and to consider products and designs that can solve real-world problems 
that gets beyond display when something actually gets made from them. SPFA has also been committed to net zero movement from the beginning. Back, uh, back then, net zero as a, a concept was the disruptor. Uh, it made sense and forced companies and customers and citizens to think about the prospect of living in a world previously unfamiliar to them, a world with a commitment to net zero energy usage along with the environmental, social benefits that come from that. Companies began bringing more distributed generation technologies online beyond wind and photovoltaics uh, to include micro turbines, fuel cells, and more that were big engineering challenges. And those challenges turned into practical implementation of policy and regulatory challenges that are still being worked on today. But spray foam insulation and roofing was also a disruptive technology. It kind of still is today because competitors and entrenched market leaders do everything they can to make us you know, not succeed. But it was and is a technology needed to accommodate the increasing energy efficiency demands of customers and the emerging knowledge and understanding of building science, air leakage, and total thermal performance of structures. Uh, even something as seemingly simple as an unvented attic was only recognized in the code in 2007, and those air leakage requirements keep getting more stringent, and the more they do, the fewer technologies are available to meet them beyond spray foam. That mention of the building code, something that of unvented attics in the building code, something that makes so much sense, uh, only being recognized so recently shows how glacial the pace is for change to things that make obvious sense. That's one of the main reasons that we at SPFA are so supportive of this DOE effort with you all, because the stuff didn't exist when we were your age uh, as the students. We watched the Jetsons and dreamt, but had no similar resources or body of knowledge that you all do today. Programs like this are pushing this kind of practical thinking to an earlier stage in your lives and preparing you to make much more accelerated technology, design, and construction decisions that are going to speed the adoption and implementation of all of it beyond the glacial pace that we've all been subjected to. Uh, I just want to note quickly, uh, in terms of bonus fetus, that, uh, that SPFA has been publicly engaged on the Net Zero movement for a long time. We sponsor the annual Vertical Net Zero Conference in California. We write a lot of articles and assessments of net zero efforts, particularly in California. Work with the California Energy Commission on Title 24. And California customers get them in a position to meet their energy efficiency targets, just like we do around the rest of the country. We, uh, we highlight tiny houses and net zero houses that utilize spray foam, trying to raise awareness of the construction uh, practices. And we've been lucky enough to have Sam Rashkin speak at our convention. And we have Jeff Farrell uh, speaking at our 2019 show in Daytona. Jeff's the vice president of Mandalay Builders and a member of the EVA board. And he's coming to highlight spray foam's role in this huge development project that they have going on in the Arizona desert, where the entire development is basically invisible to the grid. This uh, this project was written up in the May edition of Net Zero Buildings magazine, uh, if anyone's interested in, in, in looking into that. But spray foam's performance really is unrivaled when used as an insulator or roofing solution. If you look at the Superdome, a lot of people don't even know that spray foam is used as the actual roof. Uh, Post-Katrina, reconstruction of the Superdome, that big white roof with, under the Mercedes logo, all spray foam. Uh, under the body panels, all spray foam down to the ground. A proven use of the technology from the 60s, uh, since people have been doing roofing and installing spray foam roofing. You have white roofs and reflective roof coatings. Those are an incredible complement to rooftop photovoltaic. Things like this tend to get drowned out in the misinformation uh, to some extent that exists online about spray foam, but we want to make sure that you and your teams and the professors have the information, resources, and expertise you need on spray foam beyond what I could squeeze into six minutes today. Uh, I just wanted to make that leave the message with you that to make the most of the use of the resources and materials that we have and spray foam beyond just dealing with windows and doors, we're here to help and invite you to contact us for any reason to answer any questions. I mentioned Rick here in closing. Uh, Rick goes by a couple of nicknames. He always hates them, but I call him Rick Sanchez once in a while because he is a genius miracle worker. Minus the portal gun. I also call him Triple D once in a while for Dr. Dick Duncan taking liberty with his first name, Richard. But frankly, I don't care what you call him. Just call him. Uh, if there's something he can do to help you, we have resources and, and the people that, uh, that can help you in your projects. And we stand ready to assist in any way that we can. And thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you, Kurt and SPFA. Our next presenter is Adam Davis with ASHRAE. Adam Davis has over 15 years of mechanical design experience in a broad variety of applications. As principal at Weston and Associates, he is the key point of contact for the client and is actively involved in design and construction administration. 
He has designed several LEED certified buildings and he has versed in the principles of sustainable design and experience in their practical integration into building design. Adam is currently the ASHRAE Student Activities Committee Chair. Adam? Thank you. Um, so ASHRAE is a, uh, is a global organization of 56,000 members in over 130 countries. We have 14 regions throughout the world, 180 chapters, 250 student branches throughout the world. So if you guys are participating in this comp competition, it's likely there's an ASHRAE chapter close to where you are. Um, I strongly encourage you guys to reach out and, and contact your local, um, either student branch or your uh, local chapter. ASHRAE offers professional development opportunities, networking opportunities with established uh, industry leaders, and access to new technology, publications, and educational resources. It's kind of that that, la that bottom line there that, that's key to you guys with your uh, design competition. Um, ASHRAE's vision is to be the global leader and foremost source of technical and educational information and the primary provider of opportunity for professional growth in the arts and science of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning refrigerating. Um, so for students, uh, uh, well, standard members pay $260 to uh, be an ASHRAE member for a year. We offer a significantly discounted rate of $20 per, uh, for students to be a, a member for the year. And through that, you gain access to our 55,000 members. Um, you get significant publication discounts that will help you with, uh, your, uh, with, with your solar decathlon design. You get reduced re registration fees at conferences. Next month, we are, we're having our comp, uh, annual winter meeting in Atlanta. Um, it, you know, for a regular ASHRAE member, it's on the order of, you know, about $450 to attend this conference. For students, it's $25, and you get the full access to all the technical presentations, our student program that we offer, um, all the technical committees and, and such that all, all happen at that winter conference. And I hope to, uh, to meet some of you while, while we're uh, meeting in, in uh, Atlanta. Um, one thing that we do care about is that if you do go into the HVAC industry, that you remain an ASHRAE member. So what we've done in order to help promote that is we've, uh, we have a Smart Start program, which does a uh, kind of deferred uh, or, or a reduced, uh, reduced membership fees for student members that trans transfer into a associate grade after graduation. Um, in order to participate in that, though, you do have to be a student member before um, before you graduate. We also offer scholarships and grants. Um, the grants applications are due in three days, so likely if this is the first time you're hearing of that, um, you still have still have some time, but uh, uh, you might might want to get working on that. So, next slide. So Ashray offers a fair amount of resources. Um, like I said, if, if you're competing in this and you have questions about the HVAC system that you're putting in, in with, your, uh, with your design, reach out to a local student, uh, to a local chapter. Show up to a chapter meeting. You know, we, each chapter typically has a website with their uh, chapter meetings published. And just show up and introduce yourself. Um, local chapters love to hear from students and love to help students. Um, if you guys, you know, have questions, or if you need somebody that actually does this practically day to day, show up to a chapter meeting and raise your hand. Uh, you're you're definitely welcome at any of our meetings, and um, and we encourage that. Also, don't be afraid to ask um, questions. I remember my first first ASHRAE meeting I went to. I didn't understand something that was you know uh, airside economizer, which is kind of you know a pretty fundamental basic uh, you know item in an HVAC system, and. Uh, you know, everyone understands you're you're new to the industry and you're just getting into it. Um, so you know, don't be shy. Uh, for your for your um, competition that you're working on, we do have significant amount of resources. If you go to the ashray.org/residential, I think you'll uh, be able to find some standards there that will be of use to you. 
Uh, one is the ASHRAE ICC 700-2015 National Green Building Standard. Um, the other is the standard 62.2, which is the ventilation acceptable indoor air quality in low-rise residential buildings. Standard 55 is the thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. Um, not listed is ASHRAE standard 90.2, which is the um, low-rise residential energy energy standard that ASHRAE has published. And um, all of these are available for you guys if, if you're student members at a discounted rate. Um, next slide. So here, again, here's um, just kind of what those uh, resources look like. Ashray, what they, you know, what we do is we get together in in rooms a couple times a year and we correspond. And the the people that are really passionate about, you know, certain aspects in HVAC all get together and and write write these standards. We're a grassroots organization, so the people that are writing these standards are, you know, the same people that are working on the projects that I'm designing and and the people that you bump into it at at an Ashray chapter meeting. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of wrapping up here, ASHRAE has been long considered a leader in commercial and in institutional building design, construction, and operation. In 2014, um, the Society looked at our role in residential in exploring how we can contribute most efficiently to the improvement of performance of residential buildings. Uh, the Residential Building Committee was created in 2015, and um, the goal of that Committees kind of look at residential trends that are happening in the industry and see uh, see how ASHRAE can uh, help influence these trends and, and look at the potential impacts and make recommendations um, in policies. So, if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact Katie Thompson, who is our ASHRAE staff liaison for student activities. Her email address is listed there in her. Uh, desk phone numbers listed there. Um, if you're going to be in Atlanta, please introduce yourself. I'll be um, kind of heading up the, the uh, student program that we're putting on on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Ashray. Our next pre presenter is uh, Bill Ranson from DuPont Building Performance Solutions. William W. Ranson is the leader of the Building Knowledge Center, a team that uses DuPont's industry-leading building science to support and grow our customers through field support, content development, and industry influence. He has over 16 years of experience managing and developing scientific professionals in delivering those results. Prior to joining DuPont, he completed his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech. His hobbies include traveling, reading, and anything about wine. Thank you, Bill. Your turn. Hi, uh, this is William. So if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. What we're going to be showing you uh, for DuPont Performance Solutions is a combination of two companies that have come together over the last 18 months, being DuPont's Heritage Tyvek business and Dow's Heritage Styrofoam and Great Stuff businesses. So if you go to the next slide, uh, similar to some of the previous presenters, we'll be talking all about the combination of products we offer to help provide energy efficiency, durability, help prevent water intrusion, help prevent air leaks, help prevent vapor getting in places you don't want it to get, helping maintain thermal comfort and efficiency in the home. So what we're showing here is residentially focused, the entire suite of products we have, basically everything you need to separate the inside from the outside. Some brands that you'll quite recognize, the Tyvek wraps, which help with managing uh, water leaks, managing air leaks, helping control vapor, but also allowing buildings to dry out. You see styrofoam, which is not only great for below grade insulation to improve a home's energy efficiency, but also being used on walls, uh, either by itself or in combination with Tyvek uh, to provide uh, continuous exterior insulation, again, helping with multiple aspects of maintaining the proper building envelope. Uh, we also have the grand, uh, the brand name Great Stuff, as you see called out in a few places there. Uh, so again, we're also strong supporters of the building science behind uh, spray foam, uh, as well as we have some roofing underlayments as well. So we can really cover the whole whole building envelope from the top to the bottom. And if you go to the next slide, we'll show also we have a similar set of products 
as you move into more multifamily or what we often call light commercial type buildings where there's some higher performance requirements. Uh, so now you start getting into some more products like Thermax, which again, uh, exterior insulation type product that has improved fire performance as well as providing all the benefits of exterior continuous uh, insulation. Also so the suite of the Tyvek brand products that are more targeted towards commercial spaces as well. Uh, froth pack, some insulation that goes in roofing applications, uh, protect, you know, roofing underlayments as well. And still the great stuff, again, for the air sealing, as we heard from some of the other previous uh, people, uh, if you don't get a good envelope air sealed properly, that really energy efficient HVAC and water system you put in is going to struggle. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Lastly, then as you move into even heavy commercial, uh, depending on what specifically you're designing, we also have a suite of products that fit there too, uh, based on either uh, Thermax or extruded polystyrene, as well as some Tyvek products, including our Tyvek fluid applied product. It has all the properties of a Tyvek uh, WRB wrap, uh, but it is applied in a paint fashion or sprayed on uh, a paint sprayer type fashion instead of mechanically attached. So we have a whole suite of products for whatever building you're looking to make, if you go to the next slide, to really help people, as we said, separate the outside from the inside. So both Dow and DuPont have years of offering these high quality products because we've seen building envelopes typically fail because either their products they use are not well designed or good performance, they're installed poorly, or the actual detail, the design of it is done incorrectly. And we have a way both heritage companies, which now as we brought it together, we, we talk a lot of what we call the power of two, that we both are excellent at providing not only high quality products, but we know the products work and helping people with designs and making sure they get the details right, but most importantly, helping people with field support on, jo on the job site, observations, training people how to install our products correctly, offering certified installer programs for our, our um, some of our distributors as well. So we really help not only with having top-notch products, but making sure those top-notch products are put on the way to do the job they're intended to do. So you go to the next slide. Um, because, and you hopefully will hear this message repeated over and over, a lot of the other people who are sponsors of this, we're in violent agreement when it comes to building science about making buildings both energy efficient and durable but you really can't do one without the other. So when we talk about you know energy efficient and managing the thermal with air barriers and insulation, we have all the products to help you do that in the wall. At the same time, you know, if, if you can make an energy efficient home, but if you're having moisture issues and don't properly address air leakage, water leakage, et cetera, with all our Tyvek and uh, styrofoam branded products, you're gonna have long-term problems as well. So you really can't do one without the other. And we now have solutions that fixes all of them. So if you go to the next slide, which I think if I remember is one of my last one. Right, so our, our DuPont support, I've listed our website here because we have a huge amount of technical content on our website, installation guides. We can help you locate what's called a specialist in, uh, specifically in the market, whatever location you're designing as obviously not only codes, but building um, styles vary from region to region. We have people, uh, 168 of them at my last count, last last week all over North America and in Canada that are intimately familiar with not only our products and how they go together and mesh with other products as, such as exterior sheathing, um, but also making sure how they meet the local building codes and requirements. Uh, we have uh, CAD drawings and specifications up on this website here as well, and also some health product declarations that, you know, those are needed as well. Uh, so we have lots of uh, material to help you. And if we go, I can't remember if I have one more or not, uh, my last one, that was my last one. I, I would just add at the very end on top of the website we showed there. We also strongly encourage you to go to some of the other websites that you'll be seeing today. Uh, we were members of ASHRAE as well, strongly supportive of them. They have some great information as well. Um, there's some third party consultants. So obviously we pay to support our product, but also have some additional great literature too. If you look, Google search people like Building Science Corporation or Construction Instruction, those are third party uh, consultants that also have very helpful tools to make sure you design the building envelope properly. And lastly, on that website there, if there are questions, that there's links on there to how to enter our inquiry process to ask us questions directly if you can't find the answer anywhere else. That's all I had. 
Thank you, William and DuPont Building Performance Solutions. Our next presenter is Sean Quinn from HOK. Sean is firm-wide performance design leader and is a sustainable design leader in HOK's San Francisco office, as well as chair of HOK Impact, the firm's social responsibility and community service initiative. Sean leads HOK's partnership with the International Living Future Institute and Biomimicry 3.8. Sean? Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so just to start off, I want to introduce a little bit about HOK, Helmuth Abada Kassebaum, um, an architecture firm founded in uh, the 1960s and have grown from uh, a small practice in St. Louis doing um, single family um, education uh, and some cultural buildings um, to a fairly global practice, um, exploring a wide variety of markets and services. Um, and really at the core of um, our values has really been the essence of trying to integrate high performance um, and healthy resilient building design um, into our practice in response to some of the changing conditions of um, climate change, um, urbanization, as well as globalization. Moving to the next slide, you can see the broad sector of all the markets that we represent from aviation, transportation, civic and co corporate commercial buildings, education, as I mentioned, um, but also science and technology, recreation and wellness, hospitality projects, high-rise buildings. <clears throat> Ironically, pretty much everything in the scale of buildings with the exception of single family residential which is what all about what the solar decathlon um, is focused on. Um, and where this becomes relevant um, isn't necessarily um, uh, the dichotomy of scale, um, but in how you can look at um, approaches of modularity um, at a global scale and bring that down to the cost affordability that would in the same way be needed towards a, a single family building. Um, and so you go to the next slide, um, it's our services um, that really help to provide um, expertise and guidance to the Solar Decathlon teams over the course of the next several months. Um, and that is that we start off from the early onset of projects um, in programming and consulting to understand uh, what is needed in a project. Um, for architecture and engineering, um, all mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and structural um, uh, to uh, ensure that the buildings are integrated holistically and that those systems that are striving for those performance goals um, actually are sort of experienced. Um, and that's where we sort of get greater insight from our interior design groups, landscape architecture, lighting design groups, and visual, visual communications. That all of that is really about how do you sort of create not only a high performance building, but one that sort of enhances um, conscious creation around some of those topics and issues. Um, so if you move to the next slide, the holistic goal and sort of, I think, um, service offering that we bring to the table for the Solar Decathlon is really about that sustainable and performance-based design. Um, how can we work with you all um, through sort of guidance and mentorship in the utilization of building science, sustainable design strategies um, that can create these high performance, healthy and resilient buildings um, as, you know, people, um, you know, from ages of 18 to 25 or above from starting college to graduate students or PhD uh, candidates. There's such a, a wealth of experience that comes forward through the solar decathlon that encapsulates a nice opportunity um, to sort of set new standards that do grow into scale, that do begin to go from the single family um, prototype module up on larger. Um, if you go to the next slide, we've been focusing on sort of internally in our practice. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Great, um, is that every year we're trying to look at how we um, intertwine um, the building science analytic work that we're doing with other elements of our practice. Um, and while this is this year has almost been sort of a, a revisit of our decade long process of how to optimize the design, which started with um, simple integrations of softwares like Ecotect and Equest, which is now um, ballooned uh, to encapsulate over um, a dozen different software solutions um, integrated with our computational design workflows um, to really see how do you optimize the design directly in the process, not as a necessarily a feedback loop, um, but through direct um, sort of processes, workflows, as well as scripts 
that enabled designers to understand the energy implications of their work extraordinarily early on, uh, while also equipping the engineers of those projects with a much deeper um, database and knowledge framework of how the architectural design has uh, tried to establish certain criteria uh, moving forward. So the engineers that do come in to integrate through piping solutions, electrical solutions, and engineering solutions can really advance it. Uh, next slide. Um, and all that is informed by a fairly uh, deep bench um, that uh, across our 1,800 staff sitting in 22 offices, um, we are trying to establish, uh, in, in essence, a, a greater network. Um, I always uh, sort of admire the quote, uh, when an expert network is functioning at its best, uh, the smartest person in the room is the room itself. Um, so while I'm introducing myself today, Sean Quinn, um, unfortunately our performance, uh, our, sorry, our sustainable design director, Anna Calandra, was able to join. Um, you not only have the two of us at your sort of resource bed to sort of focus on this, uh, you have the deeper bench of all of our, uh, all of our firm. If you advance the slide, I think maybe one or two clicks, and you can kind of click through, um, you sort of see how we orient ourselves around these different regions, um, as well as uh, one more click, um, I think the, the partnerships um, that we bring to the table um, through work with the U.S. Green Building Council and IWBI, the International Well Building Institute, International Living Future Institute, the Center for the Built Environment, uh, as well as Biomimicry 3.8, uh, we're looking to continually try and advance solutions that lead ourselves towards a, a carbon neutral world. Um, so the next slide, um, just um, to give out um, our contact information, um, as well as I think maybe sort of leaning back again, what is our new call? Um, we've obviously heard a lot um, this year from um, the, I, uh, the uh, ICPP. Um, we've got um, the current COP um, underway right now. Um, and there's a really strong push um, to respond um, to the essence of uh, global climate change um, in a much more rapid way than I think uh, people had initially forecast. Um, HOK is on target to be carbon neutral by 2030. We're currently about 60% um, better than the CBEX targets um, across our global portfolio. Uh, and so we're trying to sort of open our book a little bit more um, to share not only with students, but with um, uh, colleagues, competitors, um, and industry, uh, the solutions that we have put forward. And so we're uh, signature members of the Pair Solutions Campaign uh, that looks to drive that knowledge into the marketplace um, so that these solutions can be adopted uh, much more quickly, much more avidly, and much more affordably. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, HOK, for that message. Uh, all right, our next presenter is Tom Butters from the Illuminating Engineering Society. Tom is the Director of Education for the IES. He is responsible for developing and delivering lighting education to the IES membership and the public at large in a multitude of modern modalities. He is the immediate past president of the IES Toronto section and an award-winning presenter and lighting educator. Tom? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the IES is, uh, is thrilled to be a, a sponsor in the decathlon. If we go to the next slide. and the one following. One more, please. Thank you. Um, the IS has been uh, around since uh, 1906. Um, the IS mission statement is it seeks to improve the lighted environment by bringing together those with lighting knowledge and by translating that knowledge into actions that benefit the public. The IS is a standards or organization for lighting standards throughout North America. It is a volunteer organization with over 8,000 members globally. We have 96 sections throughout uh, North America, Canada, US, and Mexico. We put together uh, numerous standards, uh, keeping them up, updated, uh, similar to ASHRAE, and it's specializing specifically on uh, lighting. Um, from an education perspective, we deliver uh, a, week, a monthly live webinar um, which is free for IES members, and we now presently have over 60 online education offerings for IES members. We also offering, offer networking and career development through industry, social, and society events. If you could go to the next slide, please. So, how does IES create value for its members? Well, for a student membership, it's $25. And if you take a look at from a monthly webinar perspective, it's $20 per, per webinar. 
in one in one year it's 240 dollars and as a student paying 25 dollars you would get free access to all of those live webinars but you also are able to uh, get into the archives information a couple of these books i'm not going to get into all of them I, i'm going to be touching on the ready reference in a couple of slides that's the one far on the right but the far on the left one the forum for illumination research engineering and science is a education scientific lighting blog that the real geniuses within the lighting community present topics on and then you can literally have a dialogue with these individuals it's a brand new uh, program that was released in i think just in august and um, it's just wonderful if you want to really learn something from from the grades uh, next slide please As I mentioned, we have 96 sections across the uh, across North America. Um, we do a lot of different um, uh, programs to support them. We have education uh, materials. We also have dedicated section discussion forums that will be on our upcoming uh, new uh, website. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide I'll spend a little bit more time on. Uh, in August of 2018, the IAS launched their uh, Ready Reference app. It is a free app for anybody who's interested in lighting that can be uh, downloaded at the Apple Store or Google Play. It has a very limited but basic illuminance tables, including all the illuminance tables for residential, as you can see there. It has a multitude of topics along. 15 different different topics on lighting that you can have right at the palm of your hands totally for free and we also have the RP16 which is nomenclature and definitions for lighting that's again available uh, uh, right at your hand and the way I like to explain um, RP16 is it's like a lighting Wikipedia but it's correct next slide please We also have outreach into the into the global community, um, co conferences, uh, different types of summits. We have a research summit, which we just uh, had in Atlanta in April on, on light and health and light's effect on health, which is an interesting topic that we really can't get total agreement on. And I think that's what makes uh, lighting so exciting in, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our next annual conference will be held in, in Kentucky in, in August of 2019. And I encourage any of you uh, who have interest in lighting, really want to learn about lighting and lighting effects and effects all of our lives. Um, and you really, every, every memory that you see has come from light and to better understand it and better understand how you can model it, present it, et cetera, is a great strength to have. And next slide, my final slide. And here are the contact uh, people that you can contact if you have various questions on any of the topics that are here. You can also specifically for um, the decathlon, you can contact me at tbutters at ies.org. And thank you very much for having us and we are thrilled to be involved. Thank you, Tom and IES. Uh, we appreciate your insight. Our next presenter is Kimberly Llewellyn from Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC. Uh, Kimberly Llewellyn has a background in environmental engineering that has been put to use in the construct construction industry since 2010, working as a mechanical designer and educator on the subject of VRF and healthy integrated mechanical system design. For the past two years, she has been with Mitsubishi Mitsubishi's performance construction team, which is committed to providing healthy, efficient, reliable mechanical solutions to the high performance building market. Kimmy, Kimberly? I'm here. Hi. Hey. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, hi, I'm also thrilled to be here um, in Mitsubishi Electric. We're actually Mitsubishi Electric Train US. Um, because we have entered into a joint partnership with TRAIN. 
Um, so our logos will all be changing, but um, our equipment will not be. Um, I, I'm going to spend very little time talking about the company because I wanted to take this opportunity, these short few minutes with you, to just review some of what I consider to be the most important design considerations um, as, as related to HVAC. Um, so about the team that I'm on, performance construction team, um, like the introduction said, what, what we're doing is we are responding to the industry's um, changing landscape, which you know we, we're all very much aware of, and this program is is a reflection of that that um, that that we are are built. What our norm was yesterday, what is I mean, what our norm is today is um, high performance yesterday, and so what we're seeing is our standards constantly. Um, changing and we're raising the bar on energy efficiency, durable, durability, and health. Um, and so our team is, is addressing those, um, those, the special needs of that market sector. So in terms of um, design considerations that as you all are embarking on your um, you know, early stages of designs, I want to plant these seeds in your minds. Um, so I'm assuming that you're going to be designing spaces with lower loads than normal construction. Um, when we talk about lowering our loads, it's important to understand that, um, that we're really just talking about lowering our sensible loads in our living spaces. Um, and and I'll just as a you know as a concept, I want to make sure that people are clear on as having sensible loads, which are heat loads, um, in spaces. So the thermal load um, um, when we're in our cooling seasons, that is what most people think of in terms of sort of like dry heat. And then we have a latent load, which is what we is associated with uh, humidity, and um, what's happening with our spaces as we're designing more and more efficiently is that those sensible loads are going down, but the latent loads are actually in many places going up because we also have um, increased requirements for ventilation. Um, and we're generally designing with materials that have much less hybrid buffering capacity. That just means that they hold less water, more hard surfaces. And, um, so that's in, important to understand because while, you know, while you might see uh, lower loads in general, the, the amount of humidity control that's required has actually increased. Um, and that's not across the board. I mean, those of you who are designing in arid spaces in, in the Pacific Northwest probably don't really have to worry about that. But some of the other stars that I saw pop up, even in spaces where you wouldn't consider maybe it would be necessary, um, it in fact is. So I want, I, want to, I want to challenge you all to see if you can achieve your, your um, form goals, so the aesthetics that you're going for, if you can achieve those hand in hand with functionality goals. And when we, you know, when we look at our, some of our highest performing building spaces, like passive houses, for example, they, they almost require you to build around mechanical spaces. And, and there's a reason for that. I mean, we say integration, um, but, um, but sometimes we don't know what that means in actual practice. And in terms of HVAC and distributed hot water, it means, it means having a core with the shortest distribution runs possible. So on this slide, I've, you know, I've circled a utility closet here um, that's very centrally located. That's where we've got HVAC, that's where we've got an ERV, that's where we've got a heat pump water heater. And all of those systems require very short distribution runs um, because of the placement. So, you know, I'd, I'd challenge you all to consider putting your mechanical systems in some central location in order to be able to um, be more efficient in the distribution of whether we're talking about heating and cooling or we're talking about um, ventilation air or um, domestic hot water. 
Um, next slide, please. Another thing I want you to consider is that, you know, for this is true for all systems, but, um, you know, I pulled up a slide here from our sizing uh, program called DSB, Diamond System Builder, which is a free program that you can go online and download. And, and what this illustrates here is that we always think in terms of nominal, what we'll call nominal capacities, and that means what's on the nameplate of the piece of equipment. Um, but when you actually put systems into climate locations and you connect them up to other systems and you include the refrigerant line lengths and elevation even, um, those systems deliver different capacities than what are on the nameplate. So um, what this is, is really an ACA manual less a supplement or tool to help you make sure that you're sizing systems according to their loads and not just relying on um, nameplate capacities. Um, next slide, please. So this is an illustration of what I was talking about briefly before, and I'll just use this as a bookmark um, to call attention to the, the, the importance of um, ventilation in your design. Um, and so I, I, um, I do sit on ASHRAE 62.2 ventilation committee. Um, and so um, we're, uh, I'll be the first to tell you that there's not absolute consensus on how much air we need um, um, and how we should do it. But the, I'd say that there is growing consensus in the high performance building market that we need balanced um, ventilation and that we need some form of heat recovery in, in almost all spaces. Um, and in these places that I pointed out here on this slide, um, what those hours are for locations like Boston and even Wichita, Kansas, are those are the hours out of the year where you see higher humidity conditions outside than what you want to have inside. So that's just a real simple way of, of um, trying to communicate that message about in many places, if you're ventilating to codes or to ASHRAE standard 62.2, you are going to need to make some consideration of uh, dehumidification. Um, uh, next slide, Rachel. Thank you. And so I just wanted to close by showing, um, showing you all an array of products that Mitsubishi Electric offers. Um, we have a variety of both ducted and ductless units, as well as a host of control options, um, both proprietary and also we have options for interfacing with some of these whole home automation systems like um, Alexa and Nest um, and several others. So um, I'd like to also point out here um, at the top that mylinkdrive.com address is a it's a host of, there you can find a host of information there um, I think that I can confidently say that as a manufacturer we make available more engineering data um, to anybody who wants it and you can find it all right there um, I will also say that last year um, we offered a webinar to those who were interested um, on HVAC design and coordination and we'll do that again um, early on, say first quarter of next year, if, um, if we have enough interest. So we will talk about ventilation, integration, and design um, of HVAC, so layout and sizing. That's Great. all Thank I've got. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly and Mitsubishi Electric Train US. Our next presenter is Ray Tonges from NEHB. Ray is the president and founder of Ray Tonges Builder Incorporated and a home building company based in Austin, Texas, which specializes in mainstream high performance custom homes and renovations. Ray is the chair emeritus of the National Association of Home Builders Green Building Subcommittee, having served as the chairman from 2001 to 2008 and a founding member since 1999. He also served as a NEHB National Vice President and a member of the NEHB Green Building Task Force. Ray? Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, uh, I'd like to congratulate all the 
uh, student uh, competition entries. Um, I've had the opportunity to be a juror the last two years, and I found it quite invigorating and humbling. And uh, it is good to know, as I'm in the twilight of my career, that our industry is in good hands, and I think it's reflected by the quality of the entries and uh, the thought leaders that are coming out of our universities. I'd also like to thank the other sponsors for their support of the National Association of Home Builders. The National Association of Home Builders is really a volunteer organization of volunteers. Uh, we have over 140,000 members, um, and as Sam mentioned early in the presentation, about a third of those are actual uh, home building companies, practitioners like myself. Uh, collectively, we build 80% of the housing units in the, in the country. Uh, I've had the opportunity to participate and uh, chair the Sustainable and Green Building Subcommittee, and, and it has become uh, a focus of uh, education and education opportunities. If you could uh, change the slide, please. Slide, please. Uh, one of the parts of the competition that I have focused on and hope that we can assist with is industry partnerships. Part of the criteria is to build a, a structure or design a structure that is market ready. Uh, the building design is buildable by typical trade contractors at a reasonable cost in a specific geographical location. There is so much information out there and as we've heard today of all the presenter, presenters of what is available, I think a good industry partner can help maybe um, bring that to the practical market ready approach, which is critical to the design competition. Uh, we have um, the opportunity and I can offer uh, free expo passes to the International Builder Show, which is coming up this February uh, 19th through the 21st in Las Vegas, and I imagine it wouldn't take a lot of uh, uh, persuasion to get a lot of students to come to Las Vegas uh, in February. Next slide, please. Uh, to assist in this industry partnership, um, we have home builders associations uh, across the country, 700 or so. Next slide, please. This is a slide of the entries last year, and you can see that we have a home builder association, which is basically uh, made up of people like myself, practitioners, as well as those that support the industry. And there, and and we do have uh, have made a list of um, of all the entries and the home builders associations that are local. Uh, next slide, please. There are also a few student chapters uh, located around the country, and we can make uh, this uh, available to all the, uh, the, you know, the student teams that list all the universities and organizations, as well as the local home builder and contact information at their local. Um, if people don't want to do a cold call, we would uh, also offer uh, making an introductory call if uh, if that would facilitate uh, your you the students using um, the opportunity to uh, enlist somebody from a local HBA in their area as an industry partner. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also um, have put together a team of practitioners, industry experts, if you will, uh, even uh, a couple of people that have been jurors in the past and also an architect that has been a student uh, uh, who has participated in the competition. And if there's anything that we can assist, uh, we have this, uh, we're calling it phone a pro, and you'll be able to get in touch with uh, Megan Carroll, our NHB staff support. And uh, we got a phone call for her and myself at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. As I saw during the ASHRAE uh, presentation, they um, mentioned the National Green Building Standard. 
Uh, the National Green Building Standard is the basis for the uh, National Green Building Certification Program, which is a national green building rating tool uh, that has been recognized across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, we can provide a free download of that publication through uh, www.nhb.org.ngbs, National Green Building Standards is what that stands for. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the other uh, resources that we have uh, available is our sustainability toolkit. And this is uh, also um, accessible through our um, National Association of Home Builders uh, website, where you can get case studies on high performance homes, document on different green rating systems, uh, some of which are regional, some of which are national, green checklist videos, and a lot of useful practical application of, uh, of our industry. Last slide, please. Um, I listed my uh, email and phone number if there's anything I can do to assist. Also, Megan Carroll, who is our staff support at Washington, has her email and her number. If there's anything we can do as you try to enlist industry partners, we would be more than happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Ray and NEHB. That was great. Our next presenter is from the Poly, Poly Isocyanur Insulation Manufacturers Association and Justin Kosher. Justin is the president of the of Pima, a trade association that serves as the voice of the rigid poly isocyanure insulation industry and a proactive advocate for safe, cost-effective, sustainable, and energy-efficient construction. Before joining Pima in January 2017, he served as, the direct, as a director at the American Chemistry Council Center for Polyurethanes Industry. Jason obtained Justin, excuse me, obtained his BA from Illinois Wesleyan University and JD from DePaul University College of Law. Justin, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and and don't worry, an attorney will not be sitting on the juror panel uh, come April. My colleague Marcin Pizera, who serves as Pima's technical director and was a uh, was a juror last year will be uh, serving again as a juror so congratulations to all the teams and uh, thank you to the uh, fellow sponsors for making the 2019 design challenge uh, a possibility and Pima's happy to be back as a sponsor this year uh, next slide please so as was pointed out Pima is the trade association for the North American polyiso insulation industry our manufacturing members are shown there on the uh, webinar. Pima is a 30-year-old trade association. In fact, we were started in the late 1980s as a response to the Montreal Protocol. Uh, in the organization and industry came together to phase out the use of harmful ozone-depleting substances in the products. Uh, the ODPs were eliminated in response to the Montreal Protocol and also the industry worked uh, to replace high GWP components in the products with lower GWP options. Um, and like I said, we're 30 years old. Um, next slide. Oh, you're already on it. Thank you. Uh, polyiso is probably more widely known in the commercial sector. It is the predominant insulation used in low slope commercial roofing. Uh, it's selected for commercial roofing due to its uh, excellent thermal fire and compressive strength. Uh, however, given the uh, growing interest in energy efficiency uh, on the residential side, as well as uh, from a whole envelope perspective on the commercial side, the industry has developed a number of products that have been used as uh, wall sheathing, as continuous insulation uh, solutions, both for residential and commercial construction. Next slide, please. Uh, Pima maintains a website, and the address down there um, at the bottom of the screen will take you to the technical resources we have for polyiso insulation products. Uh, this is the website if you're not familiar with 
polyiso insulation, its attributes and characteristics, I would encourage you to visit and familiarize yourself. Uh, also on the website is information related to uh, the environmental performance of the products. So Kurt earlier mentioned the spray foam industries, environmental product declarations. Uh, Pima also has produced environmental product declarations for both the roof and wall insulation products. And so if you are concerned about the environmental performance of the products that you are specifying in your projects, I'd encourage you to search out those information, that information, not only for polyiso, but for any products most manufacturers do make the EPDs widely available to the public these days. Next slide. And while Pima's website contains product-specific information, I wanted to uh, introduce the project teams to a website that has been put together by a number of different manufacturing groups. And the website is continuousinsulation.org. Its name is fairly self-evident with the information that you'll find there. I know having reviewed a number of the designs uh, from last year's competition, many include continuous insulation solutions as an alternative to or in addition to traditional cavity insulation. This website here, you will find information related to continuous insulation performance from a thermal perspective, from a fire uh, performance, as well as a moisture and weather barrier performance. And on the website, you will also find design details that you can use uh, to integrate the product solutions into your designs, um, including things such as window detailing uh, and other technical issues that are sometimes a challenge for those that have not worked with continuous insulation products uh, in the past. There are also a number of calculators available on the website that will uh, help you determine uh, the value of including continuous insulation in your design um, in your design choices. Uh, and next slide. Oh, and our uh, contact information. So if you have questions uh, related to the product or organization in general, um, please contact myself uh, and or Marcin. Um, like I said, Marcin participated last year as a juror. He'll be back this year uh, and looks forward to participating with the uh, design teams now through the April competition. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Justin um, and Pima for your contributions. Our next presenter is Blythe Voigt from Affiliated Engineers Incorporated. Ms. Voigt is Managing Director of the AEI Denver, Colorado office. She joined the firm as an EIT summer intern and later as a mechanical engineer and project manager, working on a variety of complex projects. These included the design of mechanical systems for hospitals, laboratories, Bavaria, federal government buildings, and office buildings. Additionally, she has been responsible for managing and executing commissioning and construction administration contracts for many of those same clients. Blythe? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so AEI is a, a new sponsor this year for Solar Decathlon, so unlike many of those that presented in, in before me, um, we, of course, know about you know, the program and, and we have many alumni throughout our organization that have benefited from um, interactions with Solar Decathlon through, um, through their college programs. But we're thrilled to be joining um, a group of industry partners um, as a, a sponsor this year. Um, next slide. Um, just to quickly about AEI, we are located in 15 offices around the U.S. and one in the U.K. Um, as, as it was described in the bio, I currently um, sit as our managing director here in Denver and with that have proximity to uh, work at NREL um, where we were the MEP on both the ESIF project, which is the Energy Systems Integration Facility, as well as we are currently working on campus in some other ways. So uh, lots of lots of different threads um, and relationships that exist between our company and um, NREL and like I said, Solar Decathlon and the other corporate sponsors. Next slide. So uh, we, 
a little bit of stats about our organization. Um, we do focus uh, in, in a couple of uh, primary markets, um, but with each of those markets, um, healthcare, science and technology, and energy and utilities, uh, we underpin that design work and that thought process with a high performance design group. Um, high performance design group is really the thought leadership uh, behind energy and water efficiency as well as resiliency. Um, you know, ultimately looking to seek cost effective ways of optimizing those various uh, resources within a building or within a campus scale um, central plant. Uh, you know, similar to the presentation from HOK, we work very closely with our architects, our landscape, uh, civil and structural engineering partners um, in order to ultimately achieve occupant experience, um, try to mitigate climate impacts, um, and then ultimately to provide resilience and flexibility over the life of the building. Um, our building performance pr practice provides a breadth of high performance design building consulting and analysis services um, that ultimately create this out of the box thinking and deliver buildings that not only meet the program, the, the budget, but also are in keeping with uh, pushing forward uh, sustainable measures um, as appropriate. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we are in three major markets, um, the right being uh, healthcare, the center being primarily science focused, so that's federal government labs and um, higher education laboratories and private sector, and then uh, large scale plant generation, so the campus thermals. Next slide. And beyond that, we stretch into um, other markets, so data centers, um, we also uh, spend a fair bit of time in large public space uh, design and um, ultimately in, again, kind of that high-end science. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we really strive to do is to bookend uh, the design cycle as well as the construction and occupancy cycles of a building. So um, we talk a lot about, you know, being able to plug in our aspirations and desires and, and joining those with the client and, and with our partners um, in various ways. And so there's, you know, climate planning, infrastructure master planning, um, sustainable design guidelines, you know, set by a campus or, or a uh, targets identified by a corporation for reduction in carbon or overall energy use, et cetera. Um, you know, we, we then try to uh, prove that out through energy modeling um, and, and have a lot of custom tools in-house that help us to do that. We assist our architectural partners in doing facade optimization um, and building orientation um, and ultimately you know, towards the uh, occupant comfort, you know, we have the commissioning, commissioning services and building activation, ultimately to fine tune many of these early decisions in the design cycle so that they ultimately operate the facility in a way that um, meets the intent. Next slide. Um, we like to think of it again as a continuum from planning through operations and then taking that through various lenses. We see most interest um, in our in our practice in thinking about energy and water um, as well as occupant experience and resilience. And for a long time, we only thought about really the energy the energy piece of this. Um, but as you know, we think about a holistic design, um, we are now finding that based on water rates and sewer rates that go up and down in various areas across the U.S., um, that water is actually becoming um, a larger driver in our decision-making process in helping to prove out financial returns on, um, on efficient uh, systems and system selections. 
Obviously, resilience uh, continues to be um, something that is gaining more and more visibility, um, and that to mega storms, earthquakes, um, but this also to man made um, catastrophic events as well. Um, next slide, please. So we, we talk about planning um, and planning for each of these and, and going through a discussion about setting targets and understanding our codes and our, our requirements on the project and then offering where we can to make additional reductions um, towards net zero or even net positive in those cases. Next slide. Hmm. Mine is up oh, there. It is. Um, so then it's obviously taking it through those uh, many other circles. So energy, water, experience, and resilience. And then next slide is the operations piece. And to give you one example, um, a project in California with a million-dollar energy bill every year. If the building is not in operate is not operating in tune with the intended. Um, cycles of, of occupancy or um, control sequences, uh, that project found that, you know, even after being fully designed, built very well, commissioned very well, you know, that it really took about a 12-month period for the operations and operations group on campus to be able to operate the building effectively. And when you start thinking about a million dollar price tag and then, you, you know, if that building is operating even 10% out of whack, um, on its on its energy use, um, those are real numbers that are absorbed by the institution and not realized at the beginning when they they thought about their investments in these um, high performance systems. Next slide, please. So again, um, AI has a group of building performance practice engineers as well as mechanical and electrical engineers that do more of the heavy lifting on the design, and they use all different types of platforms in order to help to analyze for a uh, rough order of magnitude, and then all the way down to, you know, fine, fine grain analysis for um, uh, tuning of the building. But, um, you know, it, it's a group of about 25 professionals spread across those 15 offices here in the U.S. and and given our diverse geographies, we likely have um, an office, you know, that's proximal to a lot of the institutions that are going to be competing in the Solar Decathlon. So while I'm just one um, uh, from that organization, you know, you'll essentially have access to many of us. So I guess lastly, you can kind of click through these. Um, the ultimately, you know, there's part of it is is thinking about a project, um, considering all of the various options, um, but ultimately as you, as you continue through your design and you build your project, um, you'll have measured, you'll have modeled and measured data. And so understanding potentially where the discrepancies might lie is really an important part of, of the process of building performance. So if you click through, um, these are just some of the examples of the EUIs for various buildings um, and how they compared model versus measured. Next slide. So in closing, um, affiliated engineers, uh, we look forward to participating in Solar Decathlon and, and being part of your um, part of your process this year and, and perhaps learning about the process as much as participating. So thank you. Thank you, Blythe. All right. Our next presenter is uh, Rick Duncan from the Spray Foam Coalition. Rick is currently Technical Director for the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. He holds a PhD in Engineering Science and Mechanics from the Pennsylvania State University, an MSME from Bucknell, and a BSME from the University of Maryland. Rick is a registered professional engineer in Pennsylvania and is a certified BPI building analyst. Rick? Okay, thank you, Rachel. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the teams that have made it this far. And uh, you only have four more months to go. Uh, 
until we see you at the competition in Colorado in April. And I, I say that because, like Ray, this will be my third time returning as a juror, and I can't wait to see uh, the innovation that I expect here in, in a few months. So just to begin things, um, I'm uh, representing the Spray Foam Coalition. We are a trade association of spray foam manufacturers. Uh, next slide. The Spray Foam Coalition, it recognizes that energy efficiency begins with the building enclosure through proper control of, of, of heat through R value, air sealing, and moisture control. And to do this, uh, the Spray Polyurethane uh, uh, Foam Coalition, they perform advocacy, including research and development to support building code standards and regulations for the industry. And they also promote a safe, and uh, proper stewardship and education for the use of spray polyurethane foam. Next slide. The Spray Foam Coalition members are listed here. You will see some companies uh, uh, that you're familiar with, a lot of uh, manufacturers of, of chemicals. Uh, the actual suppliers of the foam materials themselves are listed uh, here in, in, this, in this list, the ones with the asterisks are associate members, and they are upstream chemical suppliers or equipment suppliers in the industry. But all in all, there are about 15 different what we call systems houses or supplier members that manufacture and deliver the chemicals uh, for the contractors to install as insulation. Next slide. Um, along with this membership, it requires a code of conduct for all members to be sure that they are providing safe instruction and proper uh, product stewardship uh, procedures and proper education regarding the use and application of spray polyurethane foam. Next slide. Now let's talk a little bit about what spray polyurethane foam is. It's a material that is brought to the job site typically as a two-part liquid. It's mixed and applied right on the job site in which it, these chemicals then expand into a polyurethane foam, which provide not only insulation, but an air seal and a vapor retarder. For example, there are actually three types of, of foam insulations that are used. Uh, the first is a low density or open cell spray foam. It has an R value per inch of somewhere between 3.6 and 4.5 R per inch, comparable to fibrous insulations. But the difference between the open cell foam and fibrous insulations is that it also provides an integral air barrier. The next type of foam, in a spray foam insulation that's used is a medium density or a closed cell foam. This provides an increased R value because of the low thermal conductivity blowing agents that are trapped inside the cells. And its R value is between 5.8 and 6.8 per inch. It too provides an integral air barrier and also a class two vapor retarder that may be needed in some building enclosure designs. And not to forget the third type of spray foam in the industry is also a closed cell spray foam which provides an air barrier and a vapor retarder performance but this type of foam is used on low slope roofs. So you, you can allow yourself to install this product as a continuous insulation, cover it with a, a polymeric coating, and you have uh, an integrated monolithic roofing system. Next slide. There are significant benefits from air sealing the building. As an example, some homes can lose up to 40% of their heating and cooling energy through air leakage in the building enclosure. Spray foam helps to solve this problem by sealing all the cracks and gaps in that building enclosure and can result in a significant amount of energy savings. Just to put this in perspective, there are 113 million single family homes in the US. If each of these homes used spray polyurethane foam, Americans could save approximately $33 billion annually in energy usage. In addition to that, saving energy also reduces the release of carbon dioxide during energy production. 
So making homes airtight and properly insulated has a great benefit to the environment, not to mention the, the, the cost involved of energy savings. Next slide, please. The Spray Foam Coalition provides a number of different training re resources. They can be found at the website www.spraypolyurethane.org. There is free online health and safety training for users of the product. There's also significant guidance on the use, transport, and handling of these materials, and also for the use of a respiratory protection program for contractors that are installing the products. Next slide. In terms of best practices, there is a library of different guidance documents. Um, there's one on the proper installation of spray polyurethane foam. Another is on ventilation considerations when installing foam and using it as an air sealing product. And there is also a guidance on the uh, on the the installation and use of uh, of the product. So, next slide, please. In addition to the technical resources that are there for contractors, we also provide a website as a general information uh, clearinghouse, and this is called whysprayfoam.org. It provides an insulation uh, 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 industry resource for design professionals. There's a number of different videos and web pages, including uh, key topics like building codes, energy efficiency, and building science. It also helps to promote the benefits of using spray foam insulation to consumers, builders, and architects. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions about the application of foam, how it works, uh, any, any questions about safety, environmental impacts, or overall performance of the product, please give me, uh, send me an email here at this address. I can be reached at rickduncan at sprayfoam.org. Or you can also contact the executive director for the Spray Foam Coalition, and his name is Stephen Moroni, and he can be reached at the address below through the American Chemistry Council. So again, that's all I have, Rachel, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to present today. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to all our sponsors today. We appreciate all your input uh, and uh, your contributions to the Florida Cathlon Design Challenge. So now I'll go over some quick competition information for the teams. Um, please make sure you are catching the Solar Decathlon Guide. There will be some minor revisions coming in January 2019, and you can learn about that on the groups.io project site. Here is a quick overview of the timeline. Our next big timeline uh, deliverable is your project progress report um, is due from participants from the participating teams on February 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to the Dropbox, and you'll be able to find more information about that in the guide as well as on the group's project site. March 26th is when our finalist teams will have their final project report submission due, and then the event will be April 12th through 14th here at NRealm. Uh, teams, make sure you have submitted an up-to-date team roster this ensures that your team and all your members have access to the appropriate resources, such as the ones that the sponsors have shared here today. Uh, you can always send that to SolarDecathlon at nrel.gov uh, if you ha have to updates to make. Here's the groups.io project site. Uh, once you've submitted a, an updated team roster, you can gain access to the groups.io project site. There, are, there is the Solar Decathlon main site, and then there is the design challenge site that's specifically for uh, design challenge items. So you'll get, be getting messages from both of those. Specifically, when you join the site, take a look at the messages area and the files area pointed out here. Messages come from the organizers regularly, and these include messages about webinars, appropriate resources, uh, webinar, webinar recordings, and other announcement about project submissions. So please make sure you're getting those. You get them via email as well as on the groups.io project site. Additionally, um, there are files posted. So 
Uh, there's the competition guide is posted along with any attachments. There are modeling um, tools. All our webinars are posted on there as well, and some other uh, resources that are helpful for the team. Um, please remember to uh, take the required building science training. Student teams need to watch these videos or um, complete equivalent coursework. Uh, there is more information in the guide if you have questions about that or feel free to email us. So I hope you're going for the gold and racing towards zero. Uh, this is our winning team from last year. You can see how excited they are. Um, and we're excited to look forward to our 2019 winners. So in conclusion, make sure that you are tagging your social media posts, hashtag, hashtag Hashtag Slow to Design and hashtag Slow to Cathlon. We'd love to show your enthusiasm in future webinars. So with that, um, we are going to conclude our webinar. Please let us know if you have any questions and feel free to contact us that way. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you to all our sponsors.